have my own direction No one can pull me out I've always felt different from the others I'm running away now Just like that, all you wonderful, beautiful people, we are back on your screen. It's Thursday night party time with the video bros. And yes, normally Ring Respect Radio goes on first, and then we do Fusion after. But because we had a very special guest on with us tonight, Mr. Lance Anawaii joined us. We had, went on a little bit early to accommodate time frames. And man, Papa Smokes, I, I mean, I'm still real. And what a great interview that was. What an awesome human being that Lance is. I, I mean, we just keep getting lucky with having these wonderful guests on our shows, and that one definitely right up there for me. Yeah, you said it right. We've had such good luck with our guests. All have been so accommodating and so polite and nice. Lance, a real cool guy and uh, easy to talk to. What? A, and I'm just uh, looking forward even more than ever now to watching his career unfold, especially since he's in MLW and we can watch him every week. Yeah, I can't wait for that. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, before we even start getting into uh, too many things here, Pop Smokes, now Thursday nights are going to be a little bit different coming up here very soon. In fact, starting this week is a debut of a brand new show. It's going to debut on Friday of this week to accommodate a pay-per-view that is going down. And then as of next week, it is going to be hitting Thursday nights. I'm talking about a show called Making an Impact, which is going to be starring Astro Pizarro and Cody Defoe, which is going to be a review show of Impact. So what we are going to do is Bob Smokes and I are still going to be bringing you Fusion on Thursday nights, and then we're going to raid and transition over to our good friends there, giving you the Impact review. Uh, as for Ring Respect Radio, don't worry, it's not going away. Bob Smokes and I will pre-record episodes of Ring Respect Radio on a weekly basis, and those are going to come out on a Friday morning they won't be a live aspect so if you want to talk to us live you're gonna to have to join us thursday for fusion ring respect radio is going to go on after the fact on the friday but that's okay because i don't mind making room for good friends and speaking of much we're just going to play a short 10 second clip of what they got coming up Yeah, that's going to be coming up, and that's starting tomorrow, so that is going to be fantastic. Tune in as they, I believe it's the Bound for Glory pay-per-view that is taking place tomorrow night. Uh, hopefully, uh, Cody or Astrid are in the chat there and can uh, correct me on that if I am incorrect, but tomorrow night, join them for their very first edition of Making an Impact, and then consistently Thursdays after that, following myself and Papa Smokes on screen, I believe they will be airing their show, if I'm not mistaken, about 8 30-ish or something like that. Uh, so you will still be able to catch all the action from us. And uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, uh, BF8. BF8. Okay. I, I'm 
put something together there. I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> it's Thursday night. You think I'm in a thinking mood, Ed? Come on here. I'm not with the acronyms these days. I what a great energy. Lowly, yeah, it was phenomenal to have on there. And you know, bound for I I, sh I should have known, of course. But yes, and yeah, the interview was fantastic. I absolutely love doing that with Lance. And we got some other big ones coming up for you guys as well too. It is secured in place. I uh, basically just have to. Uh, you know, have a conversation with the guy just before it happens. But stay tuned on October 27th because we are going to be joined by Alex Kane right here on Fusion on Thursday night, October 27th or October 20th. My mistake. I believe it's I'll get my dates correct. Anyway, I believe it's either the 20th or the 27th. And following that, speaking of the Beaumaye Fight Club, we are going to be joined by Mr. Thomas as well, too. So back to back, it looks like we're going to be having Mr. Thomas and Alex Kane joining us on episodes of Fusion. So we've got a lot of great interviews lined up for you guys in the near future. So it's fantastic. If there's anyone you want to see us interview, uh, hopefully we got the good word in there with Lance. He's going to talk to uh, Jacob Faw too, and Juicy for us. And hopefully we can <laughs> secure those as well, too. So it's good to know a few people in the right places, Pop Smokes. Oh, hell yeah. We just made a good contact there in Lance Anawa. He knows a lot of guys in the wrestling business uh, quite well. So uh, that's good. That's good for us. It really is. Looking forward to it. And thank you again, Lance. Uh, but I uh, want to talk, before we talk about Antonio Inoki and his career, and I know Ed's got a question there for us on it, I want to talk again. This is our opportunity to plug Prairie Pro Wrestling. Again, we are heavily involved with Prairie Pro Wrestling. That is how we got the moniker, the video bros. Uh, we are the commentary team. We are the team that puts the videos together and gives them to you every single Saturday on the YouTube channel, Prairie Pro Wrestling here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And we got another big show coming up for you on October the 29th. And Bob Smokes, I've been grinding, trying to get information, trying to see who's going to be on the card because I wouldn't mind getting somebody on the show to talk some Prairie Pro with us coming up here. Maybe even next week, if I can get the information as to who might be on the card, who we can get an interview with, have them join us for an edition of Ring Respect Radio so we could talk some Prairie Pro. But one thing I was able to get, I know what we didn't have an official name when we talked about Prairie Pro last time. So here it is for you exclusively right here on Ring Respect Radio, October 29th. That is a Saturday at the Cosmo Senior Center in Saskatoon. Prairie Pro Wrestling presents Ring of Horrors. I love that name, Papa Smokes. I thought that was a fantastic touch, and it is going to be such a kick-ass show. And perfect for the spookiest time of year at the end of October. This will be a ring of horrors for sure. And I know there's a couple of treats set up, set up for the fans here, including a battle royal, which will have all kinds of drama in it and, uh, and possibly some championship uh, contender status coming out of that. We'll see about that, though. Uh, no promises yet, but uh, always some uh, classic Canadian wrestling going on in Saskatoon. Over at the Cosmo Hall, just off Broadway. All you fans, get your tickets in advance and come for this one. It is going to be a party. You know, an interesting thought that I thought of, Pop Smokes, going into this show, because, I mean, Sheik Akbar Shabazz, the first, and as he likes to say, longest reigning Prairie Pro Wrestling Champion in history, could officially be Sheiky two belts by the time he lands in Saskatoon on October 29th. Because where we worked previously over at Love Wrestling, LPW shows still taking place over at the Rec Room in Edmonton, and Sheik Akbar Shabazz and his tag team partner, Barack Carini, are going to be teaming up in a fatal four-way to try to become the very first ever Love Pro Wrestling Tag Team Champions. So when they roll into Saskatoon on Saturday, October 29th, Sheiky might not just be the longest reigning PPW champion in history. We might go back to a time when he used to come out as known as Sheiky Two Belts, and it might be relived all over again. I could easily see that happening. Wherever the Sheik Shabazz goes, the, the gold belts seem to follow this guy doesn't give a damn about anybody else in the wrestling biz. He wants the big payoffs, and the, that's what championships mean is big payoffs. So that's the only reason he comes ever to Saskatoon. He doesn't like the fans. He doesn't like us. He doesn't like the other wrestlers. He goes there for the gold and the big money, and that's what a real wrestler does. 
And, you know, the one thing he does happen to like is probably his tag team partner, somebody who, you know, a big, young, up-and-comer in the wrestling business. We've seen him tearing it up in Prairie Pro Wrestling. Barack Arini is an X-factor in the corner of Sheik Akbar Shabazz. We haven't seen anything of them teaming in Prairie Pro just yet, but we know that it has happened over on the Alberta side. And now that friendship, maybe it spills over into Prairie Pro, only helps Sheik Akbar Shabazz with that title reign. And what an impressive team they make, too. A couple of big, tall guys, a couple of well-built guys, uh, and they come in uh, uh, representing different countries and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, I could see them making some noise over in Love Wrestling, and uh, and who knows, maybe we'll see uh, Mr. Uh, Barat Gorani as one of uh, Sheik Akbar Shabazz's uh, allies uh, in helping keeping that belt around his waist. It could be, and again, uh, who knows who's going to step up to the plate next time to try to take on Sheik Akbar Shabazz. We know that he managed to slink through with holding on that title despite uh, taking the loss to Cannonball Kelly, it would, albeit by disqualification, so the belt stayed around Sheiky. Anything to win, that is the motto of Sheik Akbar Shabazz, and winning means holding on to the belt doesn't necessarily mean picking up the victory individually in the mat. But that is going to roll out Saturday, October 29th, and again, remember that you can catch up with PPW action coming out every Saturday on Prairie Pro Wrestling's YouTube channel where myself and Papa Spokes are your commentary team. It is a fantastic time. We love our time with Prairie Pro Wrestling and we're going to continue to push forward with it. But Papa Smokes, the reason that we're doing this Ring Respect Radio episode, and we, we do a lot of these to honor a lot of the great classic wrestlers of in our history and the impact that they've had on the industry itself. And a lot of the time, it's unfortunate that when we go to do them, it happens to be because the this legendary name has passed away. And unfortunately, the world lost one of the greats, probably the greatest name to come out of Japanese wrestling, other than maybe Giant Baba or something like that. But in terms of the guys who really paved the path, Antonio Anoki stands right up there. Uh, let, let's talk about Antonio Anoki. Uh, but before we do, Ed wanted to know uh, how do how do you Anokiism has changed the wrestling business? Is it for the better? How I, I'm assuming it's how does Anoki change the business uh, wrestling business? Is it for the better or not? I mean. I'll, I'll start by saying I think it's been for the better. I mean, you got to think about the things, and we're going to talk about it, the things that he laid the path for for a lot of the Japanese professional wrestling that's out there today and everything like that. Uh, also with the crossover and the fact that this guy, he, he broadened his, his style past the pro wrestling ring. He wasn't just a pro wrestler. This guy was a, a legitimate fighter at the same time, Fox Holmes. Yeah, yeah. He grew up in the MMA dojos of uh... – of uh, Japan and, and also uh, lived in Brazil for a long time in his youth, studied martial arts, uh, largely karate and uh, judo. And um, yeah, uh, strong style as we know it today <clears throat> from uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling is, is is directly from Antonio Inoki, both as a wrestler and then later as a promoter. He uh, he pushed that strong style and, and what that means, uh, it, the meaning has kind of been lost a little bit in, in the modern era, but it, it means um, having a legitimate fighting background and using techniques from mixed martial arts in pro wrestling. And Antonio Inoki was famous for going to bat for pro wrestling all his life in, in arguing that pro wrestlers are the, are the toughest and the best fighters in the entire fighting world, including all the martial arts, which sounds a little bit funny now, but I think uh, in, in the 60s and 70s and 80s when, when Inoki was getting big as a wrestler, in Japan especially, uh, pro wrestling is a little bit different there than it is here. It's taken more seriously and more legitimately. So uh, Inoki wanted the, his style to uh, dominate his promotion, New Japan Pro Wrestling, so... Uh, yeah, he had guys, uh, uh, his understudies and, and a lot of the wrestlers on his card as shoot fighters, wanting them to use those shoot techniques and use some of the uh, hard palm strikes and uh, other kinds of uh, strikes and holds in order to uh, make it their, uh, their promotion look and appear more legit. And I think a lot of people were along with that in, in believing in its legitimacy. 
Yeah, and you mentioned about uh, the New Japan <clears throat> stuff. Uh, it was in 1972 that actually Anoki founded New Japan. I believe that this was uh, around the time of leaving, uh, was it JWA, if I'm not mistaken, or something yeah. that he was yeah. working alongside with Giant Baba, and he had left and went and created uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and that's uh, that's become one of the biggest uh, companies in the world when it comes to professional wrestling today. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know that... Inoki was brought into wrestling and trained by uh, the other uh, biggest cultural and uh, icon in Japan out of pro wrestling, which was Riki Dozen. And uh, that guy uh, from basically the uh, post-World War II era from the late 40s all through the 50s and 60s was by far the biggest Japanese wrestler in terms of uh, wins and such, but also uh, cultural significance and popularity. You may remember that in the 60s, uh, Ricky Dozen had a televised match against the Destroyer, as we know now as Dick Byer, the Destroyer, an American uh, masked wrestler. And uh, something like 60 or 70 million people watched that on that match on TV. And this is back in the 60s when you probably only had a couple channels and, uh, and uh, difficult to get a cable deal uh, for wrestling back then. This was just put on network TV and uh, and uh, anything that Ricky Dozen did and later Antonio Inoki, the uh, networks in Japan would jump all over it and cover it just because of their wide-ranging influence and popularity. Yeah, and man, he had such a big impact. Uh, I wanted to mention as well, too, uh, about his uh, work with Muhammad Ali. So this was the first ever like promoting pro wrestling uh, versus legitimate fighting and stuff like that but of course Anoki being a legitimate fighter himself this was not intended to be any sort of uh you know staged pro wrestling as we know it today this went to the level of shoot fighting uh, a lot of people didn't like the presentation of what happened with this entire card a lot of it was left uh fairly dry uh this big match up here I believe Ali if I'm not mistaken originally if I if I read correctly and I remember the book it was originally planned that they wanted to have him versus Andre the Giant, but that uh, didn't manifest. Uh, that went a different direction, and Muhammad Ali ended up taking on uh, Tonio Inoki. And uh, Ali really took a bit of a shit kick in when it comes to this particular matchup. We know that he is a, a, one of the best ever step in a boxing ring, but he was not necessarily prepared for taking the leg strikes and everything, the kicks that Tonio Inoki could throw at him. And a lot of damage was done to the... Uh, boxing heavyweight champion uh muhammad ali in the process yeah that's for sure and uh, i think most people would agree with your assessment that it's uh it's not much of a match to watch it, it was a it was a curiosity at the time for sure because there had been some other uh matches of mixing the the fighting arts you know boxer versus we, we talked about uh judo gene labelle a couple weeks ago uh boxer versus uh, martial artist and and wrestler versus martial artist there had been a few matches like that but my god they got the the most famous boxer of all time muhammad ali who's the champ at that time too so this now changes their match into a big money match and um yeah i, I there's been a lot of speculation as to uh as to what degree was this match a work and if you watch it, it doesn't really look like it was much of a work because uh, Inoki goes out there, obviously, with the intention of using strategy to win this, basically lays on the mat and chases uh, Ali around the ring, uh, giving him leg kicks, like you said, and uh, to the point where uh, a lot of people think Ali's career was shortened a little bit by that match. This is the damage that was done to his legs by, uh, by all those kicks and... Uh, Ultimately, the match was, uh, a, you know, a, a failure to watch. But at the same time, I'm, I'm sure they made a big gate and uh, and a lot of uh, TV money and all that stuff back in the 70s for a, a, a spectacle match like that. Well, and Ali was such a showman, too. So, I mean, they, of course, it was going to draw attention as well uh, from that side of things. And did he shorten his career? Possibly. Yeah. That, that's one thing I wish, like, I mean, going back on the uh, the film that was made about Muhammad Ali, that they would have touched on more of those kind of things. There was really not a whole lot of mention of his work with Tonio and Noki in there and everything like that. So I think they bypassed a lot of the, the great moments in the uh, 
in uh, Ali's life. But I'm going back to Anoki here. Um, so we'll, we'll get past that that particular matchup and go to another interesting one. And again, I, I want to say right now, Papa Smokes, if we don't do an homage to this next guy that I'm going to mention sometime soon, uh, then I'm, we're doing something wrong because this is one of my absolute favorites of all time. I'm talking about Bob Backlund. So Bob Backlund. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Recognized as one of the ones who had a very, very long run with the, it would have been the, was it the WWWF at the time still? The yeah. WWWF championship. Uh, but during that time, what a lot of people don't know because it's not recognized by the WWE is that Anoki actually defeated Bob Backlund and refused the WWWF championship, which is why to, by today's standards, the WWE has never recognized Antonio Inoki amongst their champions and acknowledges that Bob Backlund's run went absolutely flawless throughout. He never ended up losing the title, according to their records. Yeah, it, uh, is that what you read happened? Because I was never sure. I watched this match again in uh, prepping for this podcast. And uh, if you watch at the end... Um, it looks like Antonio Inoki and his corner really want that belt. And Backlund looks like he's not willing to give the belt to them and he leaves with it. But if you watch that again, uh, watch the little uh, scrum after the match. Not to mention for a second, this match was pretty stiff also. And uh, Inoki uh, can, could work a, a professional wrestling match, but he did it pretty stiffly. Ackland's got the bloody nose and uh, and uh, some marks all over his body. It looks like a pretty hard hitting match, but uh, to me, it looks like some confusion at the end. And I was also confused as to uh, what they had decided or what the business deal was in this, because I'm pretty sure uh, by this time it would have been Vince Jr. I think I don't I don't think he would have been interested in having his champion drop the belt in in Japan to someone that maybe the casual WWF fan didn't know so well in Antonio Inoki at the same time I'm sure Inoki would have loved to have that belt uh, even for a day or a week to uh, to pump up his own promotion uh, with a big American belt like that but again I'm unsure uh, myself in my own mind uh, after watching that match because uh, it looks like Backlund is unwilling to hand the belt over and he he looks like he's ready for a fight, kind of, and then he basically uh, hangs out a bit and then takes off out of the ring with the belt. So I'm unsure what the what the agreement was there or, or if something went south there. But uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, he's sometimes considered a, an uncrowned WWF champion. But, uh, but, you know, what does that mean if you didn't really get the crown? Well, maybe, and I, I know somebody is in the comments that might find this interesting, but what if... There was some sort of wrestling-based show coming out that would talk about what would have happened if somebody had, you know, changed the course of history. So imagine if Antonio Noki was recognized as the WWF champion. Only big possibilities could happen, and I'm sure there's going to be a show coming up very, very soon that uh, might be able to answer all of those questions, Papa Smokes, and that's uh, one of our good friends in the chat there. I won't reveal much more than that, but I know that show is not too far away, and it's going to answer all sorts of questions like that from all of professional wrestling history. Well, there you go. If you got a new show, you got one whole episode with a, a fascinating question right there. Yeah, we really do. Now, Antonio Noki, outside of being a professional wrestler, a mixed martial artist, I mean, he was kind of one of those guys that was able to get over into pop culture a little bit more and stuff like that, get recognized. But not only that, a politician. So this guy ended up being a politician in Japan uh, right through the rest of his career, pretty much there, Papa Spokes. So what, what can you fill us in a little bit more on that? Well, it was kind of a, a natural progression in a way because... Uh, he was so tremendously well known in Japan, and his face is is completely iconic. He, I'm I'm trying to draw a, a comparison to uh, him in, in our Western culture in North America, perhaps. Maybe Muhammad Ali might be something approaching that a, a person that was a household name in sports, a person that, that whose face and presentation everybody knew. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a, a version nowadays would be like a, almost like a Tom Brady, but even much beyond that, because 
Antonio Inoki had so much uh, marketing behind him. He was one of, one of the first wrestling stars that had absolutely every kind of merch you could think of, from pillowcases to lampshades to uh, fuse box covers to absolutely anything you could get with uh, Antonio Inoki's image on it would be a big seller. And, you know, he, he had that, that look that was immediately recognizable. Tall, handsome man. He's got that big, strong jaw and chin. And he always wore that red scarf. So, I mean, that was that was the brand right there. And uh, I, I think uh, I read in prepping for this that uh, he even uh, lost the, the rights, the legal rights to his own image at one point. So there were a whole bunch of companies making stuff in his image and making money off of it. And to his frustration, he couldn't be the guy making the, <clears throat> excuse me, making the money out of that. But to your original question into politics was probably a, a natural move for a, a very popular and well-known uh, person in the entertainment business. As we've seen that happens over here too. Uh, once people get their name and face out there, it becomes easier to build a political platform off of and, uh, he enjoyed a, a, a long and uh, interesting career in politics, including a couple of uh, scandals, unfortunately, which uh, plagued that career as well. So uh, with all of this, everything that anoki has been able to do and accomplish in his career, first ever IWGP champion, creating New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, can we argue that, okay, obviously, clearly one of the most impactful Japanese wrestlers of all time, definitely on the Japanese scene, uh, is... Tony Onoki, somebody who stands out there as one of the absolute legends that cemented the way we look at professional wrestling today. He's one of the ones that brought it forth. Uh, what is your opinion on that, Pops? Yeah, I think absolutely he is. Um, he could be on a lot of people's Mount Rushmore of great wrestlers and stuff, not only based on his wrestling ability, but his prowess as a promoter as well. And um, he's one of those guys that... Uh, his image as a wrestler too was the ultimate baby face all the time. Something like, uh, uh, like a Hulk Hogan was during his, uh, popular reign. I'm not talking about disgraced Hulk Hogan now, but <laughs> during the Hulkamania years when, uh, he also had all the marketing behind him, they branded him as a, as a, the biggest wrestling star and as a household name kind of thing. And Inoki was, was the guy that, in in japan he was the hero and he was the representative of the japanese people so when he brought wrestlers over from the west from uh north america uh england and and anywhere else for that matter he was the the warrior of the japanese people that would defend them and their honor against the uh outlying uh, or the outliers the uh, the foreign menaces that would come into Japan and challenge him. So uh, there was whole generations of children growing up wishing that they could be as great as Antonio Inoki and have a spot like that. So I think uh, he was the he helped form the template for the hero warrior uh, nationalistic kind of baby face that stood up for his country stood up for the fans and uh, didn't let any monkey business go on by any uh, rule-breaking wrestlers in his federation. Yeah, you bet. And, you know, we might uh, be able to bring all the information about Antonio Inoki and stuff like that because we talk about the past of professional wrestling. But uh, if you guys ever want to catch up on current New Japan Pro Wrestling or anything going over in the Japanese scene, uh, look no further than checking out the show Chop Talk from Andre C. and Melville Collins. They do a wonderful doc job talking about that and i'm curious to to see what happens this year new japan pro wrestling has an opportunity here to pay homage to antonio Inoki at wrestle kingdom i know they'll probably have something that they'll show at their upcoming uh, pay-per-views and events but i believe that this would be a perfect time for them to possibly introduce some sort of thing into new japan pro wrestling i'm not saying it has to be a championship but wouldn't it be great if there was a you know some sort of you know, a battle royal even, or even it's something that they could do to respect the lineage of Antonio Inoki and the path that he paid for everybody that's over there in New Japan Pro Wrestling today. Yeah, I hope so. That's a really nice uh, thing to think of. And um, 
I know that by the time he was done with New Japan, that there had been some friction in his parting and, uh, and not all feelings were good. And I know that New Japan Pro Wrestling tried to distance themselves a little bit from Inoki. Um, I'm not exactly sure of all the inside stories that, that happened and, and all the feelings uh, once uh, Ghetto took over the, the booking and such of New Japan. They wanted to go in a different direction, but um, I know that in the uh, anniversary show that they have every year at uh, Sumo Hall, that in the last year or two, they've started sh showing videos of, uh, of Inoki. Um, he's, he was too ill the last couple of years to actually appear there in person, but uh, they still made up uh, packages of showing his uh, place in, in the legacy of NJ, NJPW. And uh, that's heartwarming to me is because you can't bury the past forever. The, it, it, yeah, his role in starting that company is 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 monumental and uh, and for them to pay tribute to him is is really only right i think i think so too and i'm looking forward to checking out to see what they do uh, at wrestle kingdom this year i believe that is a great opportunity and a great platform to maybe even get uh, some of the younger generation of professional wrestling fans who hopefully are tuning into our show as well too and getting this knowledge that we're able to to you know research bring to you and present to you because you know it's great to talk about current professional wrestling and the way it is now but it's also wonderful to talk about the, the the trailblazers, the ones that led the way for everybody in the industry. And to, Tony Onoki ranks right up there. He is a name that is going to be synonymous with professional wrestling uh, for forever. As long as there's professional wrestling, we will always know of the name Antonio Onoki. And I just personally, before we we bring the talk of Antonio Onoki to an end, want to say that I'm a massive fan. I, I think he's laid a lot of great groundwork. And I got to ask you, Papa Smokes, if there is a match that stands out for you something that you could recommend to our listeners that they should check out from Antonio Inoki well there's uh, there are a couple of matches uh, well uh, probably a whole bunch of matches but a couple that spring to my mind that I watched recently uh, since his passing because I wanted to see some more um, he uh, he being Inoki developed the whole uh, idea and character and gimmick for Big Van Vader and he uh, had the mask with the uh, steam made and everything and, and all that stuff because before that he was just Leon White, you know, a, a boy from big boy from Minnesota and all that stuff. And he wasn't getting over, but uh, Inoki wanted to feature him in Japan, so uh, made the whole big Van Vader gimmick. Then to put him over, had his first match against Antonio Inoki, and Inoki went down to a pinfall defeat in something like three minutes. That was in Sumo Hall, and the fans could not believe this from a, a an unknown wrestler that they didn't know yet, beating their idol so decisively in such a short time. They rioted. They smashed the whole place up, and uh, this is, uh, you know, you've watched a, a bunch of uh, Japanese wrestling matches before. The fans are known to be more polite they stay in their seats. They don't make a lot of noise during the match. They'll they'll applaud and, and do their cheers in between matches, but this was not that at all. They they weren't having it. And, uh, you know, a, a, a legendary wrestler was made out of that match in Big Van Vader, but... Uh, I don't know if that is on my end or Pop Smokes' end that we have uh, lost a little bit of the the feed here at this point, but uh, I'm going to keep talking just on the slim chance that it is my, uh, Papa Smokes. Uh, if someone can let me know in the comment section, I think we're back now, Papa Smokes. I don't know if that was on my end or on your end there, but I do apologize for the glitch. No worries. The other match I was just going to quickly bring up was um, he, uh, Antonio Inoki had a match with one of his trainers, which was Carl Gotch, uh, the younger of the Gotch uh, family that, that, lived during his time and uh, uh, the, they called Carl Gotch in Japan the, the god of wrestling that was their name for him so uh, you, you know the respect that was had for uh, Carl Gotch they had a big match on Japanese TV and really pulled out all the stops this is great stuff if you can find this match I, I have 
uh, the feeling that a lot of younger wrestling fans will not appreciate the style of these guys so much. Again, these are two shoot fighters. They go at it hard, and uh, there's a conspicuous lack of uh, flipping and trampoline moves in this match. In fact, none. But um, if you want to see a historical wrestling match between two tough-as-nail shooters, who have the utmost of respect for each other, check out that Inoki versus Carl Gotch. You got it right there. Two big recommendations from the man himself, Papa Smokes. And we got an opportunity to talk very in-depth here about Tony Inoki. Is there anything else that you want to add to the conversation when it comes to Inoki before we uh, bring things to a little bit of a wrap here, Papa Smokes? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, one more thing. I think this might close up the conversation nicely is to talk about um, some of... Inoki's legacy and some of the guys he trained, which uh, were uh, grew to be uh, huge stars in Japan, from uh, Tatsumi Fujinami and Ricky Choshu were the two big ones, and they both had tremendous uh, success both in Japan and in the West as well. And then out of uh, from those huge stars came also the great Muda, uh, Hashimoto, and. Uh, Massa Chono as well. So, um, and, and from those guys, of course, even uh, more recently come Okada and Tanahashi and some of the big names of today. So, uh, uh, Inoki's uh, influence in the training world still felt in Japan. And I, I wanted to bring up uh, on that topic as well. I, I'm sure you've seen the videos too of how Inoki would slap people in the face really hard and that was his that was his show of respect when he came across a, a young wrestler that he knew had been trained properly and that he felt like might have had the eye of the tiger so to speak he would slap their face numerous times slap them hard in the face and it was a huge honor for those uh for those wrestlers to to get slapped across the face by Inoki because it was never meant as an insult from him that was Inoki passing the fighting spirit on to you and that through those slaps to the face uh, uh, he would he would give you his blessing and uh, and his support kind of thing so uh, maybe some people uh, still feeling the slap from Antonio Inoki we all do in the wrestling business because his fighting spirit lives on in the business now through those that he's uh, influenced and helped train and get into the business. Yeah, he's done marvelous things, and again, all the utmost respect to Antonio Inoki, and our condolences to uh, his family, friends, and anybody that uh, knew him on a personal level. Uh, we hope that we have had the opportunity to do justice to his career here today, but the only real justice that you can do to the career of Antonio Inoki is to go and watch what kind of matches he gave to us, what kind of things he built, and also to continue to support all the wrestlers who take influences from Antonio Inoki and the legacy that he built as well too but man papa smokes this has been one hell of a thursday night i know we have a lot of fun here on thursday nights but uh it, you know it was great to talk about antonio noki to finish things off great to talk to lance anawahi on the first half of the show fusion there as well too talks of prairie pro wrestling um but aside from that i think it's about time we wrap thursday night up and allow everybody to get on with their evening continue their beer drinking and get ready for the weekend but in the meantime and in between time, as a legendary commentator once said, Papa Smokes, where can the good people find you? Papa Smokes can be found on Elon Musk's uh, Twitter Funland. I, I'm running out of good names for this, but I still want to keep going on it. Uh, my at is Smokes underscore Papa. And then on Twitch, I'm Papa underscore Smokes underscore. Reach out to the man himself and let him know what kind of matches you're watching, what kind of stuff you want us to talk about. Uh, you can find me at my socials. I am at Real Bobby Munson over on Twitter. You can also find uh, it's a, it's a combo account, but over on Instagram you can find Video Bros SK. But you can also find out more about us through PPWYXE on Twitter as well as uh, I think it's PPWYXE or Prairie Pro Wrestling on Instagram as well too, where we are heavily involved. And you can check out Prairie Pro Wrestling every single Saturday. Afternoon, as we release new matchups, uh, we've had some great ones coming out, and that's wonderful. And yes, uh, Basser, thanks, boys. He said, uh, Thank you for joining us, Ryan and uh, Loli. This was great. Thanks, as always. Thank you. Much love and 
appreciation for everything all of you do for us here. And again, uh, yeah, check us out on the socials. Reach out. Tell us what you want to hear from us on a Thursday night coming up. Uh, we got a lot of Fusion stuff coming up with the new releases happening here soon. But we want to know, hear from you, the fans, what you want to get out of your time with the video bros on a Thursday night. But you can also catch me this Sunday joining my brunch buster brother chris parish as we bring you episode number four it's gonna be episode four of busta now a wonderful sunday talk show where we you know plan to talk about the week of professional wrestling but usually derail that thing within a matter of minutes and we just have a good old time there on sundays as well too and i, I it's not outside the realm of possibility to maybe also catch us this saturday i don't know i'll have to find out but you know the wwe does have a pay-per-view on saturday there's lots of stuff going on over there Maybe we hop on and give you a little bit of a react show. We'll, we'll see what's coming down the pipeline here for you guys. But well, yeah, to, to pop Well, folks. I was going to say uh, the, this past Sunday, I tuned into your show with Chris yeah. Parrish on Sunday. I just try and have a little peek at you guys anyway. And uh, yeah, you definitely looked like you were having a good time months and your <laughs> eyes were barely even open. So I, I know what you were up to uh, early on Sunday. Well, I haven't been up to that yet tonight. I gotta get, I gotta get a move on here and get, uh, get going. But uh, of course, I mean, we're, we might be the video bros, but uh, there's a reason that people call us the Cheech and Chong of Canadian professional wrestling. I mean, it's, it, it goes with hey, the territory. I didn't get the yeah, and I didn't get the name Papa Smokes for nothing. <laughs> That's right. So if you're ever at a live show and you want to chill with the video bros hey, come on out we got we got them we'll light them up you can come oh, hang yeah. out with us it's a good old time but you know what that's going to bring us to an end of ring respect radio and a fusion the double hitter here on thursday night thank you everybody for joining in as always showing love and support to us and to all of our friends and to that i say see you next thursday Oi! Die